Welcome to my talk about the finite element method and its implementation in C++ and Julia. You can download the slides at the address shown here on the slide. This talk is about the comparison, especially in user experience, between the C++ and Julia approach to the automation of the finite element method. The objective of this kind of automation is to be able to write very concise code that is similar to the mathematical formulation of the problem. For example, on this slide, there is a core of the code to solve Navier-Stokes equations for fluid dynamics, both in C++ at the top and in Julia. Let's first take a step back and look at what the finite element method is. When most people think of the finite element method, they think about applications in structural mechanics. In fact, most modern CAD software includes some kind of finite element code that can calculate the stresses and deformation of an object that is submitted to different forces. One of the more as attractive elements or aspects of the finite element method is that it is a very generic, rigorous mathematical framework that can be applied to the solution of a wide range of partial differential equa equations, since that's the kind of equation that we'll mostly be solving. This observation has given rise to many attempts to create generic finite element packages, where <coughs> as many of the common operations as possible to develop a finite element model are provided in a framework, and the author has to provide only the aspects that are specific to the problem, that is, the equations and the boundary conditions. A wide range of software packages implementing this approach exist in different languages. If you download the slides, the logos here are clickable and you can take a look at the different uh, packages that are mentioned. To more clearly show the objective of these automated finite element packages, I show here an extract of the first gridapp.jl tutorial. The equations on the left express the so-called weak form or var variational formulation of, in this case, the heat conduction equation, while the extract to the right is the corresponding Julia code. Before we get into the details, let's take a quick look at some of the essentials of the finite element method. The ultimate objective is to solve a continuous mathematical problem, typically described using partial differential equations on a discrete computer. The continuous problem is effectively transformed into a large linear system. To this end, the domain over which we solve the problem is discretized in a mesh, where we only store the solution on the nodes. The figure here shows a regular grid with numbered nodes, so we will obtain here a linear system of dimension 25. Each square here is called an element, and many different kinds of shapes for the elements exist. Each element is defined as a set of interpolation or shape functions that calculate the value of the approximated function at any location inside of the element. A triangle with shape function n is shown here. Matrix multiplication of n for a given reduced coordinate xi eta with the column matrix of nodal values will give the result of the interpolation anywhere in the triangle. In this talk, we will focus on the central step in the finite element method, the assembly of the linear system. To understand how this works, we look at the integral approximating the source term f. This integral can be expressed using the shape functions n, resulting in small matrices. Fast operations on these require optimized tools like static arrays.gl, which means the compiler needs to know the matrix sizes. This is the only way to make the automations as fast as hand-coded methods. Now that we have an idea of the challenges in translating a generic finite element weak form into a discrete linear system, we can look at the different approaches. The first one is the most intuitive, intuitive, where we just use a custom compiler to compile our own language. This is an approach taken by FreeFam. A second approach is used in the Phoenix Python package, where the uh, special compiler is hidden in the back and the user is only exposed to the Python language. Finally, a fully embedded language can also be used, which is what we, the approach that we will be discussing here, and which is used both in the Coolflu 3 C++ package and the gridapp.gl Julia package. To know more about the internals, you can take a look at uh, these videos. The test case we use here is the 2D flow between two planes, solved using stabilized Navier-Stokes. The parabolic velocity profile is recovered perfectly by both codes. Compare the single core, single core compile times, we see that for optimized code, Julia is slower than the C++ compiler for this case. Of course, this is comparing two quite different approaches to the problem, and we have to keep in mind that the tested C++ framework is less expressive than GridApp. 
we can also see that the optimization level for Julia has a great effect on the compile times. Fortunately, in GridUp, we can also simplify the code, which further reduces the compile time. So here we simply grouped some terms together, resulting in an Navier-Stokes solver that fits in three lines, even if you apply strict line length limits. One downside of lazy evaluation and expression templates is that the compiler generates very long parametric types, which are often printed in error, message for, in error messages. For example, if we take a look at what happens if we make an error in C++, this would be the error that we obtain. Uh, as you can see, if we scroll back a bit through it, there's a lot of text here, and in the end, we do get uh, some kind of indication. You mixed matrices of different sizes. So the error I introduced here was adding together uh, two matrices of a different size. Let's take a look at the Julia error now. This is a lot shorter. We can scroll through it much more quickly. But uh, in this case, the error is different at the top of the code here. We have a problem in convert because the error introduced in our equation results in a vector value being stored at the location of a scalar. Again, this can be hard to track down for more complicated equations. And similarly to C++, we have very long types that are generated. As discussed in the introduction, this is needed to give the compiler, even if it is a just-in-time compiler, enough information about the element matrix sizes. Stabilized finite elements, perhaps unsurprisingly, rely on use of stabilization coefficients. These are computed on a per cell basis, and thus some kind of function to compute them must be introduced into the expression. In C++, breaking into the expression template code with a user-defined function like this requires a lot of boilerplate code, as can be seen in this example. In Julia, the story is different. Here, functions are first-class objects and can be passed around freely. The only thing to keep in mind when using the function tau here is that we cannot apply it directly, but we have to use the function composition operator to keep the lazy evaluation. So, in conclusion, I hope to have convinced you that conceptually the automation of finite element methods in both C++ and Julia is quite similar. However, in my mind, Julia is a tool that is much more fit for this purpose, thanks to the just-in-time compilation and the easy integration of math symbols directly into the code, even for use as operators. Compile time is surprisingly long in Julia, but I expect this will be a continuous point of improvement for the language. We can also expect similar runtime performance between both languages, as has been proven by the GridApp team when comparing with Phoenix. For us, ongoing work is to implement the variational multiscale method. Hopefully, my colleague Carlo Brunelli will have more on that next year. Thank you for your attention. I am grateful for this opportunity to speak at JuliaCon.